Okay, we start now with uh, the study of the diffusion equation, which is the next uh, in the progression of mathematical physical equations of relevance. And the reason I choose the diffusion equation rather than the wave equation is a technical one. This is a little easier to handle and then we move on from here to the wave equation. Okay. Now uh, the equation itself is fairly easily written down, but we need a little preamble about where it comes from and what the physical significance of this equation is. And this is going to be a slightly different kind of problem than the problem of Poisson's equation, where typically we had some kind of charge distribution and you try to find the potential. Uh, here you have an operator which again involves the del squared operator, but there is also time that comes in here. So it is a partial differential equation which involves both space and time variables. Okay. Now if you recall, from elementary uh, physical chemistry I guess, uh, you are told that when you have a substance uh, like a solute put inside a diffusing substance put inside uh, a liquid for instance, ink in liquid, then this uh, due to molecular collisions, uh, collisions, this ink spreads out, it diffuses throughout. So if you have a concentration of some molecular species inside some solvent, this would typically spread out and diffuse and uniformly find itself throughout the liquid okay, as in the case of uh, ink in water. And then there are certain empirical laws which tell you how this process occurs and these are known as fixed laws of diffusion. Okay. The first of these laws and what are these laws for? You would like to find out the concentration rho as a function of space and time of a certain species. And this uh, function, this concentration is supposed to obey an equation called the diffusion equation which is easily derived if you make two assumptions. The first is this material never disappears, it is always there. So you write an equation of continuity for it right away which says delta rho over delta t plus the divergence of a current equal to 0. And this gives you the flux of this substance per unit area per unit time in any given direction. Okay. This is fixed first law. It is also the equation of, it is just the equation of continuity, conservation of matter if you like. The real physics comes in in the second law because you would like an equation for rho alone and therefore you need something which relates j to rho. And the statement made is empirical observation tells you that the diffusion process, this current flows from a region of higher concentration towards a region of slightly lower concentration. So the assumption is that J as a function of R and T is equal to the gradient of this rho of R and T, but with a minus sign to show that instead of going in the direction in which the function increases the most rapidly, it decreases the most rapidly. And of course your dimensions are completely wrong here, these two have different dimensions. So you fix that by multiplying by a constant here called the diffusion constant. Okay. Now this if you like is number of molecules or mass depending on what density you are looking at. Per unit volume there is already a length here, 1 over length sitting here. So this quantity has and this is amount of material crossing per unit area per unit time and therefore this thing here has dimensions of square of the length divided by t. The physical dimensions of d are L square over t. Okay. And now this d depends on what kind of diffusion you are looking at, the numerical value depends very much on what kind of diffusion you are looking at. If it is diffusion in an electrolyte, it is one set of values. In a gas, it is a very different set. Inside a solid, it is much slower and so on and so forth. Okay. This D ranges over a huge number of orders of magnitude in practice. Whatever it is, if you put this back in here, then it immediately says delta rho over delta t equal to D times del squared of rho. And that is the diffusion equation. and we need to solve this with some boundary conditions of some kind. We also need to specify an initial condition because it involves time. 
first order in time. Mm. By the way, uh, this is the first of the equations which uh, introduces irreversibility in the problem because it is first order in time, it is not reverse, it is not reversible. This equation is not invariant under t goes to minus t, which is another way of saying that uh, if you put in a drop of ink and it diffuses in this water, then you can wait till the age of the universe and it is not going to come back, very unlikely to come back. Okay. So, there is irreversibility built into this problem. Yes. In technical terms, the fact that this is second order in space and first order in time means that it is classified as what is called a parabolic differential equation as opposed to the elliptic differential equation which Laplace's equation was. So, that makes a huge difference, but we will see what these differences are. Now, what I would like to mention is the following. Instead of looking at the concentration, this is a macroscopic picture. This is after all the average number of molecules in unit volume at any given time. Instead of looking at the concentration, we could ask for a microscopic interpretation of this equation in terms of what each molecule does. And each of these molecules of this diffusing substance is being hit by whatever is in the fluid, in the medium, in random directions and so on. And then you could ask what is the probability that any instant of time a given molecule is at some position r at some time t. And it essentially obeys exactly the same equation. This probability density obeys exactly the same equation. You can also see this by going through this diffusion equation starting with a random walk model for a particle. And just to keep the algebra simple, let us do it on a line in one dimension and then I generalize to higher dimensions. So, if you recall on a line, in fact, we looked at a lattice on a linear lattice, if you look at unbiased an unbiased random walk, we labeled the points on this linear lattice by this integer j, j running minus infinity to infinity and asked the question, suppose this random walker tosses a coin and if it is heads moves to the right, if it is tails moves to the left with probability equal probabilities in the simplest instance. Then we ask this question of what is this quantity equal to dp over dt that is how does the probability that is at the point j at time t, how does that change as a function of time. And we got this master equation which said this is equal to the average rate at which the jumps occur that is the quantity lambda and then there was a half because that is the rate at, lambda over 2 is the rate at which jumps to probability rate at which he jumps to the right and lambda over 2 to the left. So, this turned out to be lambda over 2 he could jump either from the right or from the left to this point. So, you, you either had a flip like this or like this and then from here of course, you could jump out. So, that was a loss term and that was minus twice P of J T. Okay. This was the master equation for the probability of being at a point j at time t and then you start to solve this with some initial condition. Say you started at the origin at t equal to 0 in which case P of j comma 0 is just a chronic delta j comma 0. Okay. Now, how do you go from here to the diffusion equation? Well, what I am going to argue is that this lattice constant which I have taken to be 1 here is going to go to 0 because instead of having a unit step with points 1, 2, 3, etc., I will introduce a lattice constant. So, call this, call this distance A. I am going to let A go to 0 so that it becomes a continuous line. And at the same time, I am going to let lambda go to infinity or the mean time between jumps go to 0. The mean rate of jumps is lambda. So, the mean time between jumps is 1 over lambda, call it some tau or something like that. So, I am going to let lambda go to infinity and A go to 0 and ask what happens to this equation here. Well, this as you can see, so J times A goes to x continuous variable and then a probability will become a probability density and I leave you to work out the intermediate steps, but as you can see I could have written it in the following way. I could have written this 
as this minus p of j comma t minus p of j comma t minus p of j minus 1 comma t in this fashion and by j I really mean j a plus a because that is the lattice constant this is j a comma t this is j a this is j a minus a on this side here let us multiply by an a and divide by an a here this is the first difference and a is going to go to 0. So, what does that go to by the way what does that thing go to this is going to go become the right derivative of p of x comma t and this is going to be the left derivative and what happens if you take the difference of those two and divide by another a you get the second derivative right. So, multiply by another a you put an a squared here the whole thing could be divided by another a and proceed to the limit appropriately and then it is clear that this probability will become a probability density because now you have a continuous variable and this equation will read delta p of x comma t over delta t equal to d d 2 p over d x 2 x comma t and what is d equal to? the limit lambda goes to infinity a goes to 0 such that half lambda a squared is finite okay. So, that is how you would go from a discrete random walk on a discrete lattice to a diffusion process on a continuous line. Now, you can do this same thing in higher dimensions and it is very obvious immediately that if you had a square lattice for example, you can jump in here from these sides either and in three dimensions from all three directions this is going to become a del squared operator. So, instead of this you get an equation which would essentially say delta p of r comma t over delta t equal to d del squared. and that is the diffusion equation okay. So, there is the microscopic picture of each particle undergoing some kind of random process random collisions and diffusing or on the average the concentration itself that is the more macroscopic picture here. Okay. So, let us solve this equation and let us see how we are going to what sort of boundary condition we should put what sort of initial condition we should put and so on. Now, this is going to depend on this on, on the system on what kind of boundary you put and let us take the natural boundary condition let us say the space is infinite and the boundary condition is that the probability density is 0 at infinity starts at some finite point and then p of r comma t tends to 0 as r tends to infinity in any direction. So, that is our boundary condition and we need an initial condition. So, boundary condition p of r comma t is 0 or we might as well solve this problem in 1, 2, 3 or any number of dimensions we will do the same thing as before we solve it in d dimensions d spatial dimensions in one shot okay. and what is the initial condition that we would like to put well this depends it depends on what your initial profile is or what your initial concentration profile is but let us start with the picture of a single particle at the origin since it is an infinite space I could put any point as the origin any finite point. So, let us say I start at the origin in d dimensional space and then I let go on this. So, the initial condition is p of r 0 equal to a delta function at the origin without any loss of generality you can change this to some r naught it does not matter and we are solving this in d dimensions. So, let us put d of r okay. 
So this uh, del square is the d dimensional Laplacian where d is 1, 2, 3 etc. So that is the problem we want to solve and it is a well posed problem. We have an initial condition, we have a boundary condition, should be able to solve this uniquely these conditions. So the first step of course, this problem is an initial value problem. So little t runs from 0 to infinity and I want to convert this partial derivative into some kind of multiplication. What transform should I take? You take the Laplace transform, not the Fourier transform because t is from 0 to infinity, right. So we do Laplace transform with respect to the t variable. And the spatial variable of course runs minus infinity to infinity in all directions. So the natural thing to do is to take the Fourier transform there, right. So let us do that in two steps. So let us first say that uh, uh, the Laplace transform of P of R comma T equal to P tilde of R comma S. that is the first step. Let us put that in here in this equation and see what happens. So we have the Laplace transform of this derivative that is S times P tilde of R comma S minus P of R comma 0, you need that, right, that is the initial condition equal to D del square P tilde of R comma S. This del squared is with respect to the spatial variable does not do anything to the Laplace transform, it goes right through. So we will put that in and then you end up with S minus D del squared P tilde of R S equal to delta D that was the initial condition. So I move it to the right hand side and I get that in there, okay. I still have the del squared sitting there and now I do Fourier transforms. So let me write and let us use some other symbol because we already finished off this tilde here. So let me write uh, uh, P tilde of R comma S equal to um, 1 over 2 pi to the power d integral d d k f of k comma s that is the Fourier transform of this guy e to the power i k dot r. And of course the inverse transform f of k comma s is equal to integral d dr e to the minus i k dot r f uh, p tilde of r s in this fashion. Okay. So this is a Fourier transform pair with respect to the r variable. Okay. And then what happens when del squared hits this? it hits only this and gives me a minus k squared times the same thing here. So I end up with S plus d k squared on f of k and s, by the way this is a vector here, okay. that is the Fourier Laplace transform now of the p. And this del squared is replaced by minus k squared, so it becomes this s plus d k squared, and that is equal to on the right hand side the Fourier transform of this delta function. And what is that? It is 1, it is just unity, the Fourier transform with my Fourier transform convention 1 over 2 pi to the d d d k e to the i k dot r is the delta function, right. So this is equal to 1. which of course immediately implies that f of 
k n s equal to 1 over s plus d k square. Right. Okay. Now, we have the job of inverting these transforms. We need to invert the Laplace transform, we need to invert the Fourier transform. Now, which one would you do first? We did Laplace first and then Fourier. So, which would you now do first? Well, if you try inverting the Fourier transform, you have to do this you have to do this, you have to put this in and you have to do this integral with respect to this guy here. You have to do a d dimensional integral that is going to have k to the power d minus 1 on top. Even though this is a function only of k squared, you got to do some angular integrations and there is this messy factor and there are these poles in the denominator. And if you look at it as a function of k, the poles are at plus or minus square root of s over d. And the moment you have square root of s, this means that there is a branch point in the s plane. And you cannot do the inversion so trivially, it becomes incredibly complicated, right. You will end up having to find the inverse Fourier transform of things like e to the power square root of s, which is very bad news. On the other hand, suppose you invert the Laplace transform first, what would happen? The Laplace transform is just 1 over s plus a and the Laplace transform of 1 over s plus a is e to the power minus a t, right. So, it immediately tells you that the inverse Laplace transform, now let me call it f of k t for want of a better word. Hmm? I should have called it some tilde so that you have, you know that it is a transform of some kind. So, let us put a tilde here. Tilde. So, f of k t without the tilde in this s, this guy here equal to Laplace inverse of 1 over s plus d k squared and this is equal to e to the minus d k squared t. That is it. This does not depend on the dimensionality of space because it is just a Laplace transform and I inverted it and that is it. And now we need to invert Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform. That is all we need. So, we have to do p of r comma t equal to 1 over 2 pi to the power d integral d d k e to the i k dot r that is sitting there and then we invert this e to the minus d k square t. This also looks pretty bad because you see you got this crazy factor here which is going to give you angular integrals and so on, but you also have this k squared and you have to do this uh, integral. Now, what does this k squared mean? Remember that k squared equal to k 1 squared plus k 2 squared plus k d squared. You are in d dimensions. So, it means sums of the squares of all the coordinates in k space. How would you suggest we do this integral? What coordinate system should I choose? Hmm? I should choose Cartesian coordinates here because this thing factors immediately. If you choose polar coordinates as one is tempted to do, then you are stuck completely. You really got a mess here with ultraspherical coordinates. But if I choose Cartesian coordinates, it is exactly the same integral for every one of them all multiplied together. Because what does this imply? Yes. P of r comma t equal to 1 over 2 pi to the power d 
and then there is a d k 1 a to the i k 1 x 1 is this guy here minus d k 1 squared t and the second guy just multiplies e to the a plus b is e to the a times e to the b. So it is just this integral the same integral with x 2 and x 3 and so on right. So it is this guy integral d k d e to the i k d x d minus d k d squared t in this fashion out here and what is the range of integration since these are Cartesian coordinates it is minus infinity to infinity for each of them. So it is the same integral in which the final answer instead of x1 you replace by x2 or x3 or x3 so that is it but that is a Gaussian integral and you know how to do that because let us take a typical integral here this guy here is integral minus infinity to infinity d k 1 and let us take a 1 over 2 pi along with it because we are going to be right have the same factor for each integral e to the power minus there is a d t and then you have a k 1 squared minus i k 1 over d t x 1. and then you complete the square. So this becomes uh, i i squared k 1 squared x 1 squared sorry not k 1. So it is i squared x 1 squared over 4 d. minus the same guy i squared x1 squared and what is this it is k1 minus i x1 over dt the whole squared i x1 over 2 dt the whole squared. So it is k1 minus i x1 the whole square and then very carefully you got to keep this. Now this became a plus sign but there is an i squared here and out comes e to the minus x1 squared over 4 dt outside the integral. So e to the minus x1 squared over 4 dt outside the integral multiplying this whole thing and that is it. That is this integral. So each of these had a factor 2 pi and what we have done is this factor that is equal to this. Now this requires a little careful handling but it is doable you shift variables you shift to k1 minus this below here then the contour of integration moves up parallel to the x axis but the contribution from the two ends of the rectangle can be shown to be 0 and you can bring it back to the real axis that is tricky and I want you to try that out independently but this is just a Gaussian integral you can write this again independent of this guy it is equal to e to the minus x1 squared over 4 dt and then a 1 over 2 pi an integral minus infinity to infinity e to the minus dt k1 squared that is like e to the minus ax squared and the answer is square root of pi over a. One second. Yeah. Pardon me. Yes. Yeah, but there's also a dt multiplying it. There's also a dt multiplying it outside, so that cancelled and gave me a dt here. Okay. So that's it. So this is equal to e to the minus x1 squared over 4 dt divided by square root of 
let us take this 2 in 4 pi d t. So, now we have an answer for the full probability distribution. It is just this guy here with x 2 squared, x 3 squared, etcetera, but you add up all those exponents and you get r squared. So, it says this finally says e to the minus r squared over 4 d t divided by 4 pi d t to the power d over 2 and that is it and that is the solution. This is the fundamental Gaussian solution to the diffusion problem. What does it look like? What does this profile look like? Well, that is easy to answer. You can see that it is a Gaussian in R and the width increases linearly, the variance increases linearly in time. And then, so what is the average value R squared? This as a function of t. What is the definition of this guy? By the way, what is the average value of the vector r? What do you think it is going to be? It will be 0 because you have e to the minus r squared and then you take or x squared plus y squared z squared etcetera and you take the average value of x or y or z that is an odd function and the answer vanishes immediately which is reasonable because if you are being pushed back and forth then on the average your displacement is actually 0. But the mean square displacement is another story altogether because this thing here is equal to the average value of x1 squared of t plus etc plus the average value of x d squared of t and what is each of these guys? Well, for each of them the other variables are irrelevant. So, you could write it as e to the minus x squared over 2 4 d t 4 pi d t to the square root and that is a normalized Gaussian and now you ask what is the mean square value because the mean value is 0. And the answer we know is 2 d t because it is a normalized Gaussian. So, recall recall that uh, in a Gaussian distribution when you have square root of 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared this is the variance here or in this problem the mean square simply because the mean itself is 0. Hmm? So, it immediately this is 4 d t so the sigma squared is 2 d t and that is true for each of these fellows. Okay. So, if you are in 2 dimensions it is 4 d t, if you are in 6, 3 dimensions it is 6 d t and so on okay. and in 1 dimension you get the 2 d t again. And this is true for all time at all times this uh, problem is so simple that this diffusive behavior sets in from d equal to 0 onwards, t equal to 0 onwards and you get this linear behavior in for the mean square displacement. So, the root mean square displacement is proportional to the square root of the time which is typical of diffusive behavior, typical of uh, randomness due to this uh, molecular collisions. And you can compute all moments from here because you have a nice Gaussian solution all its moments exist you can compute every one of them. So, what we have done is to solve this diffusion equation with the given initial condition. The initial condition was that you were at had a delta function distribution at the origin, but that is precisely the equation satisfied by the green function. So, you see if you have uh, we found that delta over delta t minus d del squared p of r comma t uh, for the Laplace transform this was true, but the green function for this problem would look like this delta of t that would be the equation satisfied by the green function in this problem right. But this is the problem we just solved here. So, in solving the delta function initial condition at the origin we have actually solved the general problem of what happens if you start with an arbitrary initial distribution because this equation is invariant under translations in time you shift t to t minus t 0 nothing happens you shift to r minus r 0 nothing happens to this. Then what does this uh, problem give you? Suppose I had p initial of 
R 0 given. And now I were to ask you all right I give you this at t equal to 0 and ask what is the probability distribution at any finite time t. So, what would you say? You just integrate over the green function times this guy here. So, this would imply that p of r comma t equal to 1 over 4 pi d t to the power d over 2 integral d d of r prime for all directions times e to the power minus and now you would say r minus r prime whole squared over 4 d t multiplied by p initial of r prime 0 and that is it okay. That is the whole power of the green function and that is why I kept saying that we were finding the fundamental green function fundamental solution to this equation because this now gives you over this Gaussian kernel if you integrate your initial distribution whatever it be you get the final answer for the actual distribution. Suppose I had started not at t equal to 0 but at t equal to some t naught what would the solution look like for t greater than t naught. So, my initial point is some time t naught and I want the solution for all t greater than equal to t naught at t equal to t naught it is singular but it is hmm. how would I write what would I write here yeah just change t to t minus t naught. So, this is t minus t naught out here and this is t minus t naught. and that is it. Hmm. So, this fundamental Gaussian solution is the green function for the diffusion operator delta over delta t minus d del squared hmm. that is essentially what we found this, uh, this guy here. Hmm. Okay. Now, of course, in a real diffusion problem you would like to also put boundary conditions you would like to say this is in a finite medium and what happens at the ends of the medium and so on you need to be able to say suppose the whole thing is trapped inside a vessel and you want to say that flux is 0 does not go out it stays inside then you need to put certain conditions inside and they are of interest on their own we will we'll discuss this a little bit in some detail. Um, but let me let me ask you suppose you had a one dimensional problem and you were confined to this region inside here the diffusion is confined to this region what condition would you put at this end or this end on this p or on the concentration row if you like what condition would you side same pardon me side same. Uh, no reason why they should be the same really except asymptotically I mean if I start at some point here and I imagine this random walk problem it is clear that uh, I am likely to hit this earlier than I am going to hit that in some sense right. So, the profile need not always be uniform of course, you wait a long enough time I expect it will be uniformly distributed we will do this we will see how this comes about. But it is easier to think about it in one dimension what would be the prob boundary condition appropriate boundary condition on p of x comma t at the barriers at the barriers. Suppose, you had uh, a here and b. So, you have a less than equal to x less than equal to b and you are solving for p of x comma t given that you started at some point or some points inside here what would be the appropriate boundary condition on this p uh, at the points a and b what would be the physical boundary condition. Given that the material does not go out right does not escape what happens if a particle hits the boundary it gets reflected back it gets back here. So, the appropriate condition is not that p is 0 at the ends as you do in the pro problem of a particle in a box when you put it in an infinite potential you say the poten the wave function is 0 at the ends these are nodes at the ends here you do not say that it is reflected back 
So what's the phys what's physically happening is that the, there's no flux of particles across. There's no current across. Uh, and what's the current given by in this problem? Delta P over delta X. So the boundary condition you would impose is that at this end, uh, so you'd impose the condition delta P over delta X equal to 0 at X equal to A and B. These are called reflecting boundary conditions. On the other hand, suppose you say that the particle dies as soon as it comes out, you got blotting paper on both sides, then what would you say? This is, the thing disappears as soon as it hits the end. Yeah, you say P is 0 at the ends. The moment it comes there, the diffusion is over, the problem the particle becomes extinct. Hmm? So then you would impose P equal to 0 at this ends. Now you can have one side reflecting, one side absorbing and so on and so forth, right? So you can write down appropriate boundary conditions, yeah. If we start with a single point somewhere, yeah. so initially P will be 0 at the boundaries. Yes. If we also say that dp by dx is 0, it will always be 0, right? Why do you say that? There is no change. Ah, okay. You want to ask what happens, his, his argument is the following, he says if you put P equal to 0 and x equal to 0 at the end points, does it remain 0 at all times? But remember the differential equation has to be satisfied. So what is ultimately meant, we will see the explicit solution is what it does. But what is meant by a diff, uh, I'm imposing a boundary condition on a differential equation? The equation itself is satisfied there at that point, but you would like to have some physical condition put at that point and the difference between these two you would call 0, that is what you call a boundary condition. Right, in some vague sense, I'm saying it in a qualitative way, but we'll see. We'll write down the solution when you have a boundary and see what happens at that point. Is p identically zero at that point or not? And the answer is no. It's not. It, so, but the flux will be zero at all times. This is certainly true. So, partial differential equations have weird properties in this sense. Okay, there's another variable. There's also a t variable. We will we'll write this down. But the bare green function is already there. Is there for you. Hmm? I was not intending to do that, but we will try to solve this problem by the method of images. You can always do that in one dimension, you can always solve such problems by the method of images because what it does is to give you a green function which satisfies the appropriate boundary conditions. Ultimately, that is what you do in electrostatics as well, right. What do you, how do you argue? You say, well, the potential is unique. Once it is a well posed problem and you have a unique solution, then you replace the surfaces on which you have fixed potentials, etc., by fictitious charges which will give you the same potential on those surfaces. And then you say, well, they are equivalent problems, and therefore, if I solve one, I have solved the other. And you write this solution down by uniqueness, the uniqueness theorem. We are going to do the same thing here. The, so the method of images is not restricted to static problems. It works for all these green function problems and we will try to find the green function when you have um, two barriers for instance reflecting or absorbing etc. in terms of what uh, the method of images does. Do this. Hmm? Very briefly, if you have for example an absorbing guy here, then you pretend that there is another walker here such that when the two meet at this point they kill each other and you write the solution for that and that will give you guarantee to give you the right answer we will do that